Before we start today's video, we want to show you a short clip from our latest video, Three Cases of Time Travelers, from our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There is a link to the rest of the video in the description box below, and we'll have another link at the end of this video. As a wing commander, Hadart had an encyclopedic memory when it came to planes. He can recall the name, capabilities, and history of any plane, enemy, or ally. I remember seeing one of those back in 1935, Godard says. Impossible, the mechanic replies. It wasn't invented until 1938. Shaken by this response, Godard looks out over the Scottish air base around him. Mechanics in blue overalls busily working on yellow airplanes, including a plane he had never seen before. Then Godard looks to the sky and wonders if some younger version of him is looking down at himself from the past. Just before we start today's video, we just want to take a few moments to talk about our amazing sponsor, Magellan TV. Whenever I sit down to watch something on TV, the first thing I check out is Magellan TV's new releases section. I was so excited when I logged on the other day and saw that they had a documentary about something I've been passionate about for my entire life, and that's books. For as long as I can remember, I've been an avid reader and book collector. The documentary, The Bookmakers, looks at people's relationships with books, and they talk to book artists who are people who physically print books. Also, with the rise of electronic media, what role will physical books play in the future? Will things like e-readers take over and eliminate paper books? Or will there always be people who read physical books? Personally, I found that the bookmakers resonated with me more than any other documentary or even TV series or movie in recent memory. Even if you just have a passing interest in books, I highly recommend you check out the bookmakers. And please let me know what you think about the documentary in the comments section. You can watch The Bookmakers for free because Magellan TV is offering criminally listed viewers a one month free trial. You can also check out the rest of their catalog, which has over 3,000 documentaries. Of course, they have an amazing true crime section. To get this great offer, go to MagellanTV.com slash criminally listed. So please check out Magellan TV today because you'll find something great to watch, like The Bookmakers, and you'll be supporting criminally listed. Number 3. Philip Conahan. In April 1990, 46-year-old Philip Conahan was frustrated. He worked as a handyman who renovated warehouses. For two years, he leased a warehouse in Denver, Colorado, where he kept his tool shop. Over those two years, his warehouse was broken into eight times. The burglars stole tools, office equipment, and other items. During one burglary in July 1989, $7,000 worth of items were stolen. But the police never did anything about it. After the July 1989 break-in, a columnist with the Denver Post wrote about Conahan's problems with the thieves. Readers responded by sending him money and tools. But then, in January 1990, there was another break-in. Once again, the police didn't send anyone to talk to Conahan or investigate the break-in. Instead, Conahan filled in yet another mailed-in-yourself police report. At the top of the report, he wrote, A funny thing about this is that the same burglar has broken in four times with losses of $10,000, and not one detective has called to examine evidence. On the night of April 14, 1990, Conahan was on vacation in Kansas. That night, 19-year-old Michael McComb, 17-year-old Robert Bunn, and 16-year-old Ken Parkhurst decided to break into his warehouse. McComb was a known gang member who had prominent tattoos that read White Pride and Skinhead. He had broken into Conahan's warehouse at least two previous times. A shutter was blocking the entrance, and Conahan had spray painted, Danger, Enter at Own Risk, on the shutter. The three young men got through the shutter and on the door, who once again read, Danger, Enter at Own Risk. The three young men managed to force their way into the warehouse. When they entered the warehouse, a 12 gauge shotgun went off. 19 year old Michael McComb was shot in the chest. It turned out they had walked into a tripwire that fired the gun. His two friends ran and called 911. First responders refused to enter the building 
because they were worried about other booby traps. Conahan was called to Kansas and he claimed he knew nothing about the booby trap. But then he later admitted that he was fed up with being victimized and that's why he set up the booby trap. The next day, the police entered the warehouse to retrieve McComb's body. Philip Conahan was arrested while the police investigated the death. After he was arrested, many people in the community came out to support him. They pointed out he had asked the police for help several times, but no one helped him. Was he supposed to just let himself keep getting robbed? Some people thought that he might be protected under Colorado's Make My Day law. Basically, if an intruder breaks into someone's home and the occupant believes the person may commit another crime or they feel they pose a danger, they can use force, even lethal force, against the intruder. It was named after a quote from the 1983 movie, Sudden Impact, the fourth movie in the Dirty Harry series. But other people believe that even though Conahan was a victim of multiple break-ins, it did not give him the right to take the law into his own hands and dole out a death sentence. Also, they pointed out that McComb's death didn't fall under the Make My Day law. One reason is that the law applies to people in their homes, not their workplaces. Secondly, the occupant must believe that the intruder will commit a second crime inside the residence. Conahan wasn't in the warehouse when McComb broke in. The police and the fire department wanted Conahan to be punished to discourage other people from setting up booby traps. Booby traps can make their job a lot more dangerous. Conahan could have been charged with first degree murder. But in August 1990, 46-year-old Philip Conahan agreed to a plea deal. He pleaded guilty to manslaughter and he was given six years of probation. He was also fined $2,500 in order to pay $7,000 restitution to McCombs' family. Conahan admitted that what he did was wrong and he apologized. He said there must have been three or four attempts a month where they came in and destroyed things. It was never really a personal thing. It was like war. It was my survival and I was trying to protect. Number 2. Robert Fell In March 1979, 27-year-old Robert Fell and his wife, 25-year-old Margaret Fell, who went by the name Peggy, lived in a quaint house in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The couple met in high school and they had been married for nearly eight years. Peggy was an operating room technician at Broward General Medical Center while Robert was a technician at Community Hospital of South Broward. Peggy was an animal lover. She had a pet goat and a pet Pekingese. On the morning of March 21st, 1979, Peggy had to work. She got into the driver's seat of her Jeep Wagoneer and put it into reverse. Then suddenly, a shotgun blast hit her in the back of the head and the neck. A 12-gauge sawed-off shotgun had been positioned behind the driver's seat. A string had been tied around the trigger and then the string went down to the rear tires. Once the tires moved, it pulled the string taut and this pulled the trigger. Peggy was killed instantly. After the shooting, Robert was interviewed by the local newspaper. He said he had no idea who would have wanted to hurt Peggy. He admitted he was the police's only suspect, but he swore he didn't kill his wife. He said, We have the happiest marriage any couple in the world could have ever hoped for. She was like a goddess to me. I don't have anyone else. I've always wanted to be with her. But the police suspected that Robert killed Peggy for her life insurance money, which would pay out more if she died in an accident or if she was murdered. There was also an insurance policy connected to their mortgage. The day after his wife's death, Robert called several businesses and asked about outstanding loans. Robert had also called Peggy's workplace to ask about her death benefits. Robert then admitted to the police that he hadn't always been faithful to his wife. He admitted that he had dated one woman and he had a sexual relationship with a co-worker. 
the gun Yuzuko Peggy was unusual. It was a Savage Model 745 autoloader that was manufactured in 1946. The gun had been altered several times, including the stock and barrel being removed. Also, someone had sandblasted off the manufacturer's name and model number. Robert said that he didn't recognize the gun. He claimed he had not handled a gun in over five years. But the police were able to track down the owner. It belonged to Robert's brother, Lewis Fell. Lewis said that he had loaned the gun to a former employer, C. Bruce Pearson. The police interviewed Pearson, and he said that weeks before Peggy was murdered, he had given Robert the gun along with a few shells. The shells were very similar to the one that killed Peggy. The police confronted Robert with what Pearson said. Robert quickly added a new story. He admitted that he had got the gun from Pearson about a month before the murder. But he said he had given the gun to a black man who worked as a garbage collector. He claims that he never saw the man again. The authorities decided that they had enough evidence to charge Robert Fell with the murder of his wife. Robert was arrested on April 3rd, about two weeks after the murder. Robert Fell went to trial in December 1979. The trial lasted seven days. Then the jury deliberated for eight hours and 20 minutes. They found him guilty of first degree murder. In February 1980, Robert was sentenced to 25 years to life. According to an article from the Miami Herald, Robert should have been able to apply for parole after 25 years which meant he could have applied in 2005. But the Florida Department of Corrections website says that Robert is in a closed life sentence, meaning he'll never be released from prison unless he's granted clemency or he's pardoned. At the time of this video, Robert Fell is seven years old and he's serving a sentence at the Tomoka Correctional Institution in Daytona Beach, Florida. Number one, Michael Stevens. December 28, 1993, started off as a typical day for 62-year-old William Lazor. He lived on the St. Regis Indian Reservation in Hogansburg, New York. That afternoon, he received a brown cardboard box wrapped in tape. Inside the cardboard box was a fishing tackle box. He was suspicious and decided to open the tackle box with a rake. Suddenly, the tackle box exploded. William's chest and leg were injured, but he managed to call for help. Around the same time, 32-year-old Pamela Zor received a package at her apartment in Rochester, New York. She opened it inside the apartment while her 42-year-old boyfriend, Richard Urban, watched on. It also contained a tackle box. The explosion killed them both. When that bomb went off, 38-year-old Robert Fowler was working at an armor car garage in Cheektowaga, a Buffalo, New York suburb. He had received an identical package. The explosion killed Robert and a co-worker, 23-year-old John O'Donnell. 32-year-old Jeffrey Camp, a third employee, was injured, but he survived. West Valley, New York is about 44 miles south of Buffalo. 55-year-old Eleanor Fowler lived there, and she also got a package containing a tackle box. When she opened it, she was killed instantly. Within 90 minutes, four mail bombs had killed five people and injured two more over 365 miles in upstate New York. But it turned out that wasn't all. 27-year-old Lucille Kemp, who lived in New Albion, New York, also received a package. Her husband, 29-year-old Scott Kemp, went to open the package and he heard a click. This made him suspicious, so he called the police. The bomb squad came and took the package away. They successfully defused the bomb. Inside the tackle box were six sticks of dynamite surrounded by shrapnel. 
Scott also received a package at his workplace, Lakeview Correctional Facility in Brockton, New York. However, the package was refused by the guard at the gate. The police were able to get the package and the bomb was defused. So it turned out that six bombs were received within 90 minutes over about 426 miles. The police quickly realized that all the recipients were connected. They were all family members. 56-year-old Eleanor Fowler, who lived in West Valley, was married to Robert Fowler, who was killed at the armored car garage. William Lazor, who was injured, is Eleanor's brother. Pam Lazor, who was killed with her boyfriend, Richard Urban, in Rochester, was Eleanor's daughter. The two packages that were eventually diffused were sent to Lucille and Scott Camp. Lucille is another one of Eleanor's daughters. Eleanor had another daughter, 31-year-old Brenda Shavir. Brenda lived in Victor, New York with her boyfriend, 53-year-old Michael Stevens, their two-year-old son, Noah Stevens, and her son from a previous relationship. From the surviving family members, the police learned that Brenda and Michael had a volatile relationship. Two years earlier, Brenda had stabbed Michael in the head with pruning shears. Michael wasn't too badly injured and Brenda was given probation. Michael had also served 20 months in jail for a coupon scam that he and a partner ran. They had sold phony coupon books to businesses. Brenda's family did not like Michael and they did not invite him to family get-togethers at Thanksgiving and Christmas. So hours after the bombings, Michael was interviewed by the police. Michael made some incriminating statements. So the police decided to interview his friend, 56-year-old Earl Figley. Figley had a master's degree in science. In the 1960s, he taught high school, but he had been fired. He was in a car accident, he had lost his eye, and he was left disfigured. Also, part of his brain had been removed. Figley and Michael had an unusual relationship. Some people thought that Michael treated Figley like he was an indentured servant. At Michael's trial for the coupon scam, Figley stood at the courtroom door and tried to intimidate witnesses. When Figley was questioned about the mail bombs, he admitted that he had helped Michael buy the material for the bombs, he helped build them, and he had mailed them out. Figley said that Michael had been planning the murders for at least six months. Michael was worried that Brenda's family would convince her to leave him and take their son with her. Figley said he had purchased 55 pounds of dynamite from a company in Kentucky. Both Michael Stevens and Earl Figley were arrested the same night of the bombings. Figley agreed to a plea deal. In February 1995, he pleaded guilty to eight criminal charges, including conspiracy, transportation of explosives with intent to kill or injure, and mailing injurious materials. He was given a 20-year sentence. He agreed to testify against Michael. Michael did not do himself any favors in jail while he was awaiting his trial. He tried to get help from at least seven other inmates to help him look innocent. The seven men went to the district attorney hoping to get a plea deal on their own cases in exchange for testifying against Michael. One of the men said that Michael was trying to find someone to pay rent on a storage unit. The police went to the storage unit and found bomb making material. Michael Stevens went to trial in March 1995. The trial lasted three weeks. But it only took the jury three hours to deliberate. Michael Stevens was found guilty on all counts. The jury then deliberated for another ten minutes regarding sentencing. They chose life without the chance of parole. Earl Figley served about 17 years in prison and he was released in 2011. If he is still alive at the time of this video, he would be 84 years old. Michael Stevens is 81 years old and he's incarcerated at the United States Penitentiary, Tucson, in Arizona. 
Thank you so much for watching today's video. Don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now.